Hello and welcome. We're going to wait just a couple more seconds here for students to get logged in and then we'll go ahead and get started. We have a really great presentation today. I'm excited to hear about it. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll get started in just a second here. So my name is Carrie Feyerobin. I'm one of our admissions counselors here in our uh, undergraduate admissions department. I'm going to be uh, here to answer any questions you have about admissions or the admissions process. This is open to both admitted students and prospective students. So maybe you're just researching schools yet. Maybe you're still trying to make that decision and, and waiting for that May 1st deadline. Uh, wherever you are, we are glad that you're joining us here today. Um, so if you do have any questions admissions related, put them in the Q&A, please. If you have any questions about the Topic. I know this is a really uh, unique topic we're going to have here about is New York City dead and what that means. Uh, and I am joined by Dr. Steve Ortiz, who's an associate professor of history here at Binghamton. His primary research includes a political, military, diplomatic, and gender history in the 20th century in the U.S. And so today he's going to be exploring a timely topic of the state of post-pandemic New York City in this mini lecture. So if you have any questions related to the lecture or to the history part department, please also feel free to put those in the Q&A and we'll address them a little bit later and uh, Professor Ortiz is also maybe going to give a little brief overview of the history department before we go into the presentation. So thanks again sure. for being here and uh, Steve I will uh, pass it over to you. Okay great well thank you and thank you for being here everybody. We're, we're happy to have you with us uh, virtually tonight. Uh, my name is Stephen Ortiz and I'm an associate professor in history. The history department is a rich vibrant intellectual home with a lot of great smart researchers who are, happen to be also excellent teachers. Uh, something like nine of our 10 of our 25 members have received SUNY awards for excellence in teaching, as well as many, many accolades for their research and publications uh, in their historical areas of expertise. And so I think uh, for those of you interested in history, uh, it's a great place to, to study. Uh, you can get a major, you can get a minor, uh, you can do things like the accelerated four plus one uh, BA to MA program. Uh, it's, it's a really great place to uh, learn about areas of history that tend to not get as much focus uh, during your high school courses. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about one of those kind of areas today. And I'm going to start by uh, uh, this, and I'm gonna do that. And then uh, can you see everyone good, uh, Carrie? Here, okay, good. So my, my question today is, uh, and the, what I'm gonna talk about today is, uh, is New York City really dead? Uh, and uh, my, my hope is to uh, allow us to uh, look back at two really formative uh, eras of New York City history, the Great Depression and the 1970s, to help us think about what happens next uh, in the history of contemporary New York City, post-pandemic New York City. So let me ask the question, have any of you seen a, a poll, uh, Carrie's going to help me, but have any of you seen, uh, the poll question number one, which is, have any of you seen or heard from the media or from people you know that New York City is dying. All right, so yes, 83% uh, of you have, uh, those of you who have voted, great. So then uh, the second question then uh, is, uh, do you believe this? Uh, uh, so the second question, Carrie, do you agree with this notion uh, that New York City is dying? Curious to see, this is like a pretest to see if I can convince you uh, one way or the other. Okay, so kind of split. Not, some say yes, some say no, some say not sure. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Gary. Uh, so uh, again, about 40% for yes and no and about uh, uh, someone uh, not uh, not sure. Well, let's talk about it then. So what? let's talk about, uh, we're going to start, we're going to two different periods of time. The 1930s, really 1929. This is the image in the Daily News, October 24th, 1929, which is uh, the famous uh, stock market, Black Thursday, you see the New York Stock Exchange and the groups of people huddled around uh, trying to see what will happen next. Uh, Wall Street's in a panic as stocks crash. Uh, we know from the Great Depression that hits New York City especially hard. Um, in, important uh, ways to understand the impact of the Great Depression on New York uh, is to think about the very famous Empire State Building. Uh, the Empire State Building actually opens in 1931. Uh, and it's known in New York City as the empty state building because essentially it has no occupants despite the fact that it opened up this fancy, uh, with this fancy flyer of, uh, ready for 1931 occupancy. Uh, less than 25% of the building's retail space was occupied uh, and almost the whole upper half was empty uh, for up until basically World War II. And so in terms of real estate, commercial development, the landmark New York City commercial development is empty uh, and dark. Uh, they randomly put on lights 
in the upper floors to give the, the impression that there are people up there, but it's basically empty and dark on uh, Empire State Building. Uh, and then we also have, uh, many of you will have images in your mind of the Great Depression of bread lines, of, of long lines of men in overcoats uh, waiting for food. And, and so because you have that mental impression, I, I thought I would leave those alone and move to other types of things that were happening in New York during the Great Depression, which is uh, an explosion of homeless people, uh, homeless people who were out of work. Uh, the uh, unemployment rate in New York City in the Great Depression was approximately 33%. Uh, to give you some uh, comparison, uh, at the height of the pandemic, the unemployment rate in New York City was 16%, and so double that, and that is what the unemployment rate was in New York City during the Great Depression. Uh, you see here on Houston and Mercer and Lower Manhattan uh, shanty towns, people were evicted from their homes. You can see they have all their 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 uh, all their artwork and wall decorations from their the home that they were evicted from in 1930 alone. 200,000 families were evicted from New York City uh, tenant, uh, tenants, 200,000 tenants were evicted from New York City dwellings in one year alone. Uh, and you will see this uh, across uh, New York City and across the boroughs. This is in Brooklyn, uh, in Red Hook area of Brooklyn. Uh, shanty towns pop up here. They pop up on the Upper West Side uh, along here, which this is now uh, along Riverside Park and the Upper West Side. They, part, they pop up in Central Park. Central Park Reservoir was drained uh, for a project and essentially it became a, a large shanty town, a Hooverville, uh, as some people called it. Other people called uh, the areas, uh, uh, ironically, they called them Prosperity City or Tin City. The, uh, the place in Brooklyn, this place, uh, Red Hook, uh, went by Prosperity, Hoovertown, and Tin City. And I want to give you a sense of who, who these residents were. Uh, so in 1932, the Brooklyn newspaper, The Eagle, said, quote, most of the inhabitants of the Tin City, uh, known also as the Dump, Prosperity City, and Hoovertown, are seamen who were able to make a steady living until two or three years ago. They include Norwegians, Danes, Irish, Poles, Russians, Italians, and Americans. Uh, also a Puerto Rican uh, 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 a group of families from Puerto Rico will also join them. And this is one of the things we'll come back to about the ethnic uh, and, and diversity of New York and, and, and what it means for revival. So this is uh, Brooklyn. Again, this is uh, Upper West Side, Central Park. Uh, and so during the Great Depression, you have a devastated city. You have Wall Street is in shambles. Uh, the Wall Street stock, stock market lost approximately 90% of its value in 1929 to 1932. You have, again, in the city, 33% unemployment, homelessness everywhere, bread lines everywhere, and real economic and, and uh, social despair uh, associated with that. Now, let's flash forward to the 1970s. So New York rebounds uh, during World War II in particular, although even in the 1930s uh, with the New Deal programs, Work Progress Administration, uh, uh, jobs, uh, create all kinds of, of work projects in the city uh, to help with all these problems. Uh, the city rebounds until approximately the late 1960s. And during the late 1960s into the 1970s then, you will see uh, another crisis for the city, uh, one that we're going to sit in for a little while here. So uh, in uh, 1970s, so essentially between 1960 and 1980, some 500,000 uh, manufacturing jobs were left New York City. This is not unemployment. This is not cyclical unemployment. This is, these are manufacturing jobs that just left. They left for uh, the Sun Belt. They left for Southern communities. They left for uh, overseas uh, at the later part of this. Uh, and, and so these are just jobs that are gone. They just disappear. Uh, and it will take a, a while for, uh, that structural transformation of the economy to actually uh, unfold in New York City proper. There's also a financial crisis. When you have that level of job loss uh, and you, you will see uh, that the city and its finances were in, in, in deep, desperate times. Uh, on 1975, they are on the ver New York City is on the verge of bankruptcy uh, and will have to get bailed out by the federal government. Congress will pass a, a, a measure to bail out New York City alone. Not just not a large uh, pandemic relief bill, but just New York City gets a large bailout from the federal government. From the 1960s to the 1980s, you have a series of uh, kind of uh, overlapping drug crises. Uh, crises. 
uh, in the 1960s, it was heroin. Heroin hit the streets of New York City in a big way in the 50s. It, it, it becomes uh, pervasive uh, in New York City, Long Island, uh, all the way into the 1960s. Uh, and then it kind of dies down a tad. Uh, and then you see the crack uh, uh, boom, I guess is a bad way to put it, but crack uh, epidemic of the 1980s. And so drug use uh, is uh, prevalent and rampant. Uh, in 1970s, uh, partly because of these lost jobs, partly because of, of the dislocation of and, and social kind of despair, uh, you will see in places like the South Bronx, uh, arson as a fact of daily life. Uh, landlords cannot rent uh, their buildings. They often uh, are caught, uh, you know, lighting them on fire. Other homeless people will be living in abandoned buildings, and then they make makeshift fires to heat the building, and it will catch fire. Uh, throughout the 1970s, the South Bronx in particular is burning, and I'll show you an image of this in a second. During 1977, the city will, will go uh, undergo a massive blackout that will uh, also be not just a loss of electricity, but a huge uh, moment of looting and rioting uh, in the city uh, as part of that. And crime is also a really big problem starting in the 1960s throughout the 1970s. Crime of all sorts, violent crimes, uh, arson, um, you, uh, drug, drug trade, uh, prostitution, uh, crime, gangs, and, and violent gang uh, conflict throughout the city. Uh, New York becomes a known place for muggings. It, New York in the 1970s is about as desperate a place as you can possibly imagine. I'm going to show you some images to show some of that desperation. So this is Times Square of the 1970s. Uh, many of you will know Times Square uh, from now. Uh, with all the Hollywood, um, the, I'm sorry, all the Broadway signs and all the, the, the retail space and all the big flashy signs. They were big flashy signs, uh, but in the 1970s, it was for uh, por pornographic movies, for uh, sex uh, acts, uh, or uh, uh, sex uh, shows, not acts. Uh, and you'll see all of this uh, up and down 42nd Street into Times Square. Uh, it, it is a seedy place that has uh, pornography, it has prostitution, it has all the uh, seediness that you can imagine of, of contemporary life. Uh, this is from uh, the 1975, uh, where uh, Gerald Ford, the president then, uh, according to the Daily News, says to the city, drop dead. He initially said he'd veto the bailout, uh, and only when he is told by the chancellor of West Germany that this will cause a major financial crisis in the world, does uh, uh, Ford agree to uh, sign the congressional bailout of New York City. This is some of the images of the fires in the South Bronx. Uh, the South Bronx, uh, basically after the Cross Bronx Expressway is built, I-95 Cross Bronx Expressway is built, South Bronx becomes a real place of despair. Uh, and again, you'll see fire after fire after fire throughout the 1970s, uh, mid-1970s. In fact, uh, on 19, in 1977, on the broadcast of the Yankees-Dodgers World Series, uh, Howard Cosell, who's the announcer, uh, they were showing aerial footage. So this is the old Yankee Stadium, and you can see a big, like, four alarm fire going on there. And they could hear the sirens, they could smell the smoke in the stadium. And uh, Howard Cosell very famously says, Ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning on national TV. So, despite this moment of glory for the city with the Yankees, you know, in, in the World Series, uh, it became a real uh, way to highlight how uh, desperate uh, the Bronx had gotten uh, in that time period. Uh, this is from the blackout. This is, these are people leaving Manhattan in, uh, to across the bridge uh, to get out of, it, of the city after electricity went out. And then this is the city at night. Uh, with, uh, and those of you who know the New York City skyline will of course know that the World Trade Center towers are no longer standing. But you will also know that this is not at all what the New York City uh, lit skyline looks like. This is an image of the, that night of the blackout. And the image of the next day from the blackout uh, is Brooklyn. Fires set uh, on retail store, uh, uh, streets uh, in Brooklyn. There was looting in the Bronx, looting in Manhattan, Fifth Avenue looting. Uh, all of this kind of social unrest happens. Uh, in this darkness of, a, of the blackout of 1977. And then crime. So uh, during the blackout also, there was a famous uh, serial killer afoot uh, named the Son of Sam. Uh, you can see him here, right? Uh, and uh, David Berkowitz is the Son of Sam uh, killer. 
uh, who uh, terrorizes the city during the blackout. Uh, and people are freaked out about crime. You see an image of uh, Puerto Rican, uh, kind of Puerto Rican, mixed Puerto Rican uh, gang uh, from uh, South, Har uh, South Bronx, uh, or maybe Harlem, I can't remember now. Uh, and gangs became a big part of the city. Gangs and crime become such a big part of the city that even in popular culture, you will see New York in the late 1970s, 1980s being featured as this place for crime. So in 1979, the movie Warriors, the Warriors comes out, right? These are the armies of the night. And this group of people here, the Warriors, uh, are chased by all these gangs across the city. They are 100,000 strong. They outnumber the cops five to one. They could run New York City, right? So there's just a, a movie, popular culture about gangs and about the impact of gangs on New York City. And then there's a movie that is broadcast in uh, 19, uh, sorry, is, uh, uh, put out in 1982, I believe, called Escape from New York, uh, in which the premise of the, of the city is that Manhattan is so drug, is so drug crime ridden that essentially the United States uh, turns New York City into a walled maximum security prison. They close off all the bridges and tunnels uh, out of, in and out of Manhattan and create a basically a maximum security prison in which uh, there are no prison guards. It's just the island itself, Manhattan Island itself is a prison. Breaking out is impossible. And the premise here is that the president of the United States helicopter goes down in Manhattan. This guy goes to help him escape from New York, even though it has become this violent criminal hellhole. Uh, and, and that is a, a big part of, of what they are doing here in this movie. So in the 1960s, in the 19, I'm sorry, the 1930s and the 1970s, um, New York is in desperate condition and uh, it rebounds in both cases. And I wanted to use that uh, thinking about the past, to think about what to expect, uh, what to think about moving forward and give you some tips as to what I think are some of the really critical reasons why uh, New York City has consistently rebounded even from these really desperate moments. Um, the 1930s, 1970s, and now, you know, uh, New York City can, uh, remains a global financial center despite the fact that the Pacific Rim is now uh, probably a, a bigger source of commerce in terms of overseas trade rather than Europe. Uh, it remain, New York City's port uh, in the port of New York remains a, an enormous major commercial hub and center for transatlantic and, and transoceanic trade. And that's the same. That's not, that's not changing. Uh, its role as an artistic and cultural center. Uh, in the 1930s, people thought Hollywood and Los Angeles and California, that is where the new artistic and cultural center will be. By the 1940s and 50s, New York is again, right where it's at, despite the fact that Hollywood remains out there. Now in the 50s, New York, it's TV and art and dance and jazz uh, and ballet uh, and all these and museums and all these things that are uh, make New York, New York. Uh, in the 1970s, People were uh, in the middle of the 70s saying, yeah, it's going to, everything's going to move to California. That doesn't happen then either. Uh, again, Hollywood remains in, in, out there, but uh, the New, York's, New York's role is a magnet for cultural and artistic talent and as a center of, of showcasing those talents and of the history of those, of those areas it remains. Uh, it, New York City's role is a news and information center. Uh, most of the major news networks, uh, in, and, and that includes you know, MSNBC and, and Fox News, uh, come out of New York City. Uh, and, and that when you control, not control, when New York City remains the focal point of the transfer of news and information, it's always in the news. It always is a place that people are, are thinking about coming to. And even when one of those networks might be saying New York City's dead, they're still there. They're still broadcasting from there. Uh, you know, the Jimmy Fallon show is still coming from, you know, uh, the NBC uh, location and, and Rockefeller Center. I mean, the things are still happening there, even though Broadway shut down and all a lot of museums and everything shut down. Uh, there's still news and information coming out of New York. A big point, and this goes back to my uh, comment about uh, Brooklyn in the 1930s. That at, so during the 1930s, you know, uh, New York City had received in the teens, uh, 19 teens, people from Russian Jews and Italians and people from uh, uh, the Slavic peoples from Central Europe and, uh, and people from all over the world. But th those are main population streams that had uh, come into New York City and infused it with a vibrancy, entrepreneurial people looking to uh, better their lives for themselves and, and their families and for their generations to come. After World War II, going in the 1960s and the 70s, 
you have different streams of people. You have uh, Black Americans coming from the South to get out of Jim Crow South, to uh, infuse New York City with the vibrancy of Black culture. You have uh, Puerto Ricans coming from the island. You have people from Cuba and then in Vietnam. And after the 1970s and into now, you have immigrants from Latin America and from East, and East Asia and, and Africa and all around the world, Eastern Europe. And all these people bring a vibrancy, uh, 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 intellectual vibrancy, a cultural vibrancy. They don't just fit into the existing economic structures. They create new ones and new ways of doing business uh, and new ways and new areas for business. Huge part is that New York remains the uh, uh, receiving area for very diverse populations. There are changes in leadership. In the 30s, uh, LaGuardia, Mayor LaGuardia, in the 70s, uh, you will see a change of leadership from uh, Kerry to Koch. Uh, you'll see uh, eventually a, a change of leadership here as uh, Mayor de Blasio uh, is in his last year of his term. And that new leadership will bring new ideas and new ways to approach this. And then now, um, uh, New York can look at these uh, periods of, their, of its past, of their past, and say, we've done this. Right um, in 19, the 1970s, no one else in the in the country was going through what New York was going through, really. And so, you know, they felt I mean, New Yorkers felt like during the Great Depression, okay, everyone's going through this. But in the 1970s, no one was really to the extent that New York was, and they 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 fought through it and they emerged from it better and stronger uh, and vibrant. And so, my question to you would be a third poll question. Uh, now that we've discussed it. Uh, which of these factors do you think will lead to New York's revitalization and not the predicted death? And if you think none of the above, like you think it's going to die, so be it. That's fine. I'm happy to, to uh, hear your opinions on this. We have numbers ticking up. So let me just finish while people are voting this. So uh, hopefully you'll get a sense of uh, thinking about um, the past not just as some archaic thing that we want to know so that we can say we know the past, but thinking about the past of ways to inform our decisions and inform our way of understanding our present. And if, you're, if you come to the history department at Binghamton University, uh, one of the things we talk about is what is con what, what's the contemporary relevance of, of this? Uh, and we will continue to talk about that uh, as time goes on uh, in history classes. Uh, let's see here. So uh, right now, leadership, uh, looks like a, a winner uh, of 50%. We're still looking here for uh, returns. Uh, Artistic and Cultural Center, none of the above. Okay, so there's still a pessimist in the group. Okay, so I'm going to uh, uh, emerge from uh, that and I'm going to uh, stop sharing and I'm going to see if there's any questions that I can answer about anything. Thanks, Steve. So uh, maybe while students are thinking questions that they have about the history department or uh, about that lecture, I thought that was really fascinating, Steve. So um, I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, maybe you could share something that's kind of unique that students tend to participate in outside of the classroom uh, in the history department. I know we have some students who kind of do cross PPL things or, or get sure. involved. I know there's pre-law organizations that yeah. students do to go beyond class. Yeah, so uh, history students get involved in a number of things. I, I would say uh, there's two really big ones now. Uh, education minor and club that uh, has allowed history students to, if they're thinking about maybe becoming a secondary education teacher, to do that. Uh, they also are really active in, in the political organizations, uh, political clubs uh, on campus. Um, one, like recently, uh, I, I know students from my over my shoulder, the politics, law and society learning community at College in the Woods are involved in the Roosevelt uh, Institute, which comes up with policy innovations and recommendations. And then they talk to actual leaders in communities about try, trying to uh, enact some of those policies. Uh, and it's, it's been a really do, a pre a predominant uh, group in, with history majors. Uh, we, have, we also have a lot of people involved um, in pre-law. Uh, so pre-law continues to be one of our uh, big areas of interest. Um, and one of the things that the, uh, a lot of students are doing now is that they're Binghamton students. They want to be broadly educated. They want a liberal arts education, but they're thinking about maybe a career in business. And one of the things that we, uh, I've been uh, helping a lot of students lately is to do a accelerated or just a four plus one program 
uh, where you can get a history degree and then get an MBA from the School of Management. And that has been really, uh, it's a newer program and it's become really successful uh, for history students who love being history majors. Um, and you know they don't want, not necessarily want to teach, they're not sure, and they, and they feel like that's a, a credential that will really help them uh, in their future. Uh, and this is just some of the things that, that they're involved in. Thanks, Steve. Uh, well, we're almost at the top of the hour here. So uh, maybe we can just wrap it up with one more question about uh, what makes maybe the history department here at Binghamton or just Binghamton in general kind of stand out amongst other schools that students might be researching or looking into as they're yeah. thinking about where to go. So, I mean, one really uh, great feature of the history department is uh, if you go to a history department about our size, say about 25 people in the faculty in other universities, probably 15 will be people who do US history. And one of the things we've really accentuated is that we are a global history kind of teaching the faculty. And that, yes, we have six or seven of us, uh, seven of us now who, who do US history from colonial all the way through 20th century. But we have East Asia and the Middle East and, and North Africa and Latin America and colonial, Latin, modern Latin America, colonial Latin America, uh, medievalist and Renaissance scholars uh, of Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, all right? I mean, we have, we have scholars who really uh, and, um, approach the world. And so it is a real global education that you'll get in the history department. Um, and that uh, is a, a wonderful way to uh, steep yourself in what is going to be in increasingly an important competency that you will need as you move into your, your careers, which is kind of global competencies, a way of understanding the world around you. And by that, I don't mean just New York City or New York State or I mean the world uh, in its entirety. And the history department can really help with that, that learning curve. Yes, you may take world history in high school, but you're going to learn it from scholars. Uh, you're going to learn uh, the history of uh, just say, uh, the modern Middle East from a, a scholar of the modern Middle East. You're going to learn about colonial Mexico from a, a, a scholar who works on environmental histories of colonial Mexico. I mean, it's really a fascinating, fine grained global perspective. Thanks, Dave. I know having that global perspective, I think, is, is more important now than it ever used to be. So it's really helpful. And we work have. really hard to make sure that all of our students can study abroad if they want to. We have very little strictures. If you go study abroad and tell the history department, I'm going to be wherever, and I'm going to take a class there on the history of wherever, we will count it. I mean, we just very, we want our students to, to go abroad. And so we make it as easy as possible to have those classes count towards a history degree. That's wonderful. That's really helpful. Um, well, Steve, thank you so much for coming on, for giving that presentation. I hope everyone sure. here has, has enjoyed it. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. And if you do have any questions, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and put our email here for admissions in the chat. Uh, There's and mine. Uh, if you want to talk about history, I'm also a member of the PPL Advisory Board. Uh, I'm also a collegiate professor at College in the Woods, and I run Learning Communities and Politics, Law, and Society and International Relations and Cultural Exchange. Uh, any of those things of interest to you, uh, send me a note and I'll be very happy to get back with you right away. Thanks so much, Steve. We really appreciate your time. Thank you everyone for joining us. We have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you all for coming. Bye. Bye.